class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we'll be discussing some of the surprises and disappointments for the San Jose Sharks in the 22-23 season. Now, usually I would try to get an even amount of both of these, probably three on both sides, but this season was just such a loss for the San Jose Sharks as a whole that it was kind of difficult to find some surprises and very easy to point out multiple disappointments with the team. And so I've ended up going with a two to four split. And so the first surprise on this list is not going to come as a surprise to anybody very full-on expected to be here and that is of course Eric Carlson 101 points on the year the first defenseman in many years in the NHL multiple decades in fact to actually hit the 100 point mark and it is Eric Carlson not necessarily with a lot of other offensive support on this San Jose Sharks team he gets more points this year than he's had in his three previous seasons combined and it is not only a surprise his point total but also a surprise his amount of games played because this is the first time as a San Jose Shark in his fifth year with the team that he has actually played a full 82 game season technically he played pretty much a full year in 2021 when the Sharks had that shortened 56 game season but that's not 82 games so to see him actually remain healthy for the entirety of the year was just a surprise in itself and the fact that he also piled up 101 points just really takes it to that next level and if we're going to look for a couple of reasons for why this may have happened considering his age you would sort of indicate that that type of turnaround wouldn't be possible well the first reason is that finally he's kind of the guy for the San Jose Sharks for many years since the Sharks acquired him the Sharks have had Brent Burns on the back end as well originally when the Sharks acquired Eric Carlson it was viewed as a bit of an awkward deal the Sharks at the time were trying to pick up John Tavares in free agency but when that fell through Doug Wilson was still looking to make a splash and so he ends up acquiring the available Eric Carlson which like I said awkward because the Sharks already had a player like that but was more acceptable because oh well now the Sharks they can always have either Brent Burns or Eric Carlson on the ice at any possible point of the game and yet Brent Burns, because he could play that penalty kill, because he had that seniority with the Sharks, they were more familiar with him. It felt as though they leaned more so on him, and Eric Carlson was kind of the second defenseman on the team, which, of course, he was not necessarily used to when he was really just the one who was looked to at to be the entirety of the Ottawa Senators' offense for the majority of his career to start. So while he did look pretty good with the Sharks in 1819, once the Sharks kind of fell off and became that not-playoff team for the next few years, Eric Carlson never really found that footing again until this year with Eric Carl or with Brent Burns being traded to the Carolina Hurricanes Eric Carlson suddenly becomes the main offense on the back end for the San Jose Sharks really the only offense on the back end for the San Jose Sharks and he so he steps into this role exceptionally well and now playing, you know, close to 30 minutes a night at times, he able to put up all of these points. But another big reason could also be the introduction of the new head coach of the San Jose Sharks, David Quinn, known to be a strong coach when it comes to coaching defensemen. And so it is very possible that he had potentially unlocked that potential of Eric Carlson, the potential that we knew was there by the fact that he had so many fantastic Norris Trophy winning years with the Ottawa Senators a few years ago. And not only did David Quinn manage to really get Eric Carlson back to that known level, but he also managed to get a lot of the other Sharks defensemen to a much higher level than expected and potentially really causing them to be massive surprises and that really brings us to the second surprise here the Sharks came into this season with a pretty underwhelming defensive core past Eric Carlson you had multiple players who probably wouldn't even be bottom pairing defensemen on actually good teams Matt Benning was a like a sixth defenseman on the Nashville Predators, so not necessarily super impressive. Both Vlasic and Redim Shemek were basically healthy scratch levels last season. Mario Ferraro definitely not particularly good last year either. Jacob Megda, while looking half decent, isn't anyone isn't a defenseman who's going to blow anybody away. Since recently being traded to the Seattle Kraken, he hasn't played a single playoff game, if I'm not mistaken, with them so far this season. So indeed, the Sharks they came in with not the most impressive defensive core, and yet David Quinn managed to get significantly more mileage out of them than expected. Benning was playing at a, a top four level, not a very good top four level, but a respectable enough top four level. Mark Edward Vlasic had his best season with the San Jose Sharks since the 18-19 year. Redim Shemek, instead of being a 
you know, consistent, healthy scratch and deserving of it. He actually played decent as a bottom pairing defenseman. So generally, David Quinn got a lot out of these defensemen who you weren't really expecting much from. And if you had just taken a look at the Sharks on paper, you were probably expecting like a bottom three defensive performance, if not literally the worst in the league. So the fact that, you know, while they still weren't good, but they were respectable enough is a testament to how well these defensemen did in terms of outperforming their expectations. But now as we move on to the disappointment side, we of course have headlining that the Sharks goaltending on the year. If you've watched any of my videos discussing the San Jose Sharks as a whole this past season, you would know my feelings about the goaltending. They really shouldn't be that much of a surprise then in, se- in themselves because anyone who can take a look at the stats from the Sharks goaltending this season would know just how awful they were. Most goaltenders, if you were to take a look at their stats and you saw them close to a 3.00 GAA, you'd probably think they weren't particularly good, even with the general rise of scoring these past couple of seasons in the NHL. But the fact that Kakinen had close to a 4.0 GA with his 3.88 is just downright embarrassing for a goaltender who was not necessarily a starter, but expected to be at the very least a 1A, 1B type of tandem. This is literally like third string AHL level goaltending statistics from Capo Kakinen. And I'm not saying coming into this season, these two goaltenders, Kakinen and Reimer, were expected to be just absolute world beaters, but I would say they were expected to be at least somewhat decent. Reimer actually played pretty decent decent in the first year of his contract last year and likely should have been traded for some assets at a point at the trade deadline or potentially even at the entry draft but for whatever reason maybe they held out a bit too long they weren't willing to take lower value than they thought that they deserved from him and they end up getting punished for that because Reimer while maybe slightly better than Kakinen was still not really any good in his own right and so the expectations they weren't even all that high coming into this season for the Sharks goaltending and yet because of how terrible they were they still managed to disappoint point significantly and were indeed the biggest disappointment for the San Jose Sharks this past year. Moving on to the next disappointment, we have the only other defenseman who I didn't really mention in those surprises. I talked about Benning, Vlasic, Shemek, all outperforming, of course, Eric Carlson, but Mario Ferraro, really the only defenseman who kind of either stayed at that same level or was even more of a disappointment than last year. Ferraro already had kind of fallen off that last season. A couple of years ago, he was looking like he could be a solid top-pairing defenseman being paired with Brent Burns, but last year, it was just a complete fall-off, a a, a just off-the-rails type of season. You're hoping for some sort of bounce back this year, and it just hasn't really happened. Mario Ferraro looked multiple steps behind the play a lot of the times, pushing himself out of position. He probably had the worst defensive awareness out of any of the usually dressed, at least to start this season, defensemen, even worse than like a Redim Shemek, who ended up being a healthy scratch more often than not when the Sharks had like a fully healthy defensive core and so it was just not really good and the fact is is that nobody would question the effort of Mario Ferraro you could get any hockey coach or any hockey mind to watch Mario Ferraro's game and they would the first thing that they would say is well he's clearly putting in the effort he's clearly trying so that's not the big issue the big issue is is the fact that even when trying he's still not a very good NHL defenseman now the one thing that we can say is that at least a couple of years ago he looked better so we do know that he is capable of being solid it's just I don't know what's happened these past couple of seasons, but he's just fallen off a cliff and it has been very, very disappointing to watch. I know a lot of people are hoping that Mario Ferraro could be the guy who could potentially be the Sharks' future captain once Logan Couture is gone and potentially retired because of just how good of a locker room presence that he is. But at this point, is just not playing very good hockey. Hopefully that can change going into next season, but with two years in a row now under his belt in a pretty young career thus far, I don't necessarily hold out a lot of hope with that. So he's blocking a lot of shots. The team certainly still relies on him relies on him a decent amount considering he had 21 and a half minutes of ice time this past year, but he's barely replacement level defenseman at this point. Next we have Tomas Hurdle. Now Hurdle is a pretty interesting case because last season, similar to Ferraro, I had also called Hurdle somewhat of a disappointment. But the major reason that I had given for that was a lot of the sort of outside of the game type of reasonings. Hurdle was in a contract year, you know, potentially thinking of whether or not he might get traded, where he would be spending the next few years of his career, or maybe potentially the end of his career at this point. And so I said, because Hurdle is very emotional type of player, 
that may have been a big enough distraction to prevent him from really doing all that well but I was expecting that this year without those without those distractions now with this new contract his future very much set in place and in his control that he'd have a much better bounce back season and considering the fact that Eric Carlson was so good this year at setting up players for goals and points and just generally like that you would think Hurdle would just passively benefit and yet he kind of had a very similar point total to last season he had a very similar type of play to last season and it was just not very good from Hurdle I'm expecting a dominant performance like you would indeed expect from a player who's making over eight million dollars and yet you got like a half decent performance from a top uh, six player that you would expect from someone who's making like five and a half million dollars in a particular year as a cap hit so it was just you're you're definitely expecting more from Tomas Hurdle and generally like I said very emotional type of player and my excuses for him last season were indeed those outside of the ice situation but now I'm thinking it might be more of an on ice situation Hurdle as we know very happy go lucky player back when the Sharks were a very successful team he was the type of player who always had a smile on his face even if the Sharks would lose games and that was maybe primarily because when the Sharks would lose those games they were still generally winning on the entire year so you still certainly had something to be happy about but these days the past few years where the Sharks have been bad even when they win those games it is still generally a losing feeling around the franchise because you know that they're not necessarily going to make the playoffs and that can be a very depressing fact for a player who usually runs on emotions like Tomas Hurdle so it could be very difficult for him to actually get up and really put his his all into his on ice performance now this is in a way unacceptable because you would expect to try and get the at most utmost performance from all of your players no matter the situation but for hurdle it's a it's kind of the case where maybe that is what's really holding him back and perhaps when the sharks indeed are competitive again whether that's next season or three years from now or five years from now if even hurdle is still on the team for when that happens maybe we'll see a turnaround performance from him but for the moment maybe these are just the new expectations for hurdle he'll put up 60 points he'll be okay but we won't get the dominant hurdle that we have seen in the past and then finally, we have the last disappointment on this list, and this is generally the organization, and this is not me saying that the season itself was a disappointment. This is not me saying that the moves that Mike Greer has made in terms of acquiring players or signing David Quinn was a disappointment, but it's actually the organization's ideology of this past season, and this primarily comes down to the fact of how they decided to treat the younger players on the season and how they decided to keep all of the younger players in the minor leagues, in their respective junior leagues, or what have you for this past season now I'm not trying to contest whether or not this was the correct choice it very well might have been a smart move to try and season these players a bit more to give Eklund more time and a full season with the Barracuda to give Bordalo more time and a full season with the Barracuda I'm not going to contest if these are good choices what I am just going to say is that this was an extremely extreme extremely tough season to watch as a San Jose Sharks fan one of the most boring seasons I have watched as a San Jose Sharks fan and I've been watching for many many years at this point it, it was just it it was difficult to try and just turn on these games and actually watch the full 60 minutes because you didn't really have much to watch for. Yes, Meyer was playing well, but you knew that he would be traded at some point near the trade deadline at this point. So you're not even watching for like the future with Timo Meyer. You're just kind of hopefully enjoying some goals. And then of course, Eric Carlson was exciting. But again, you're probably hoping that he's scoring these points so that the Sharks could unload this massive contract. You're not really getting a lot of future prospects here for the San Jose Sharks a lot of the things you're watching are just completely done by the end of this season so there wasn't a ton of fun when it came to watching these 82 games and that was a big and the big reason why was because the Sharks came kept a lot of these young players actually all of these young players outside of the San Jose Sharks sphere so I don't blame them for this choice like I said it may have very well end up being the correct choice but in a more selfish sort of way, I was hoping to get some more exciting games this year, and because of this organization ideology and this philosophy that they had this year, it didn't really end up happening. But that will do it for this video. Indeed, the San Jose Sharks had a lot more disappointments than surprises, and hopefully that could be something that turns around a bit next season. Class dismissed.